So how many of you have been to Ted and Shirley Manson's house? Oh, a good number of hands, more than I expected. So I've been over there a few times. And I was thinking, actually, uh, my introduction, so God only knows, uh, I've been struggling with, how do, how, do, how do I introduce what it is I want to talk about today and what I want to share with the Word of God? So I was thinking, 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 and then I thought, I've got a great idea. Ted and Shirley Vance's house. I want to share a little bit about that. I think we'll pull that into, into sharper focus in a few moments. Think about time, how time oftentimes changes the way that we do things, the way that we do things, right? So I have my property, I live on a few acres. The guy who lived at the front house had some cows, and so they had a milking barn. And the milking barn is set up where the cows can stand and eat, and they will poop and do whatever they do and make messes, and there's a way that you can all shovel it out and clean it and, and take care of it. And then there's another section of the barn where it has a uh, has a stove, and I use that other section of the barn for my chickens. It was never intended for my chickens, and so now I'm looking to transition from a chicken coop to another chicken coop, and there's all that transition part. So as I go over to Shirley and Ted's house, at the front door they, on the inside they have a light switch, right? And their light switch is not like most light switches, like the control. No, it's not old. It's just different. It's got a light switch. Not like this one, even. Because this one is a push button. That's for the outside light. <laughs> just, just telling you. <laughs> okay, it's off. <laughs> so, theirs is a push for on and a push for off. Their door lock, last time I was there, Shirley and Ted were having a problem shutting the door. And so I, I looked at the door and readily I could see that there was an issue. And so I said to Shirley, Shirley, I need a high tech tool that Ted may not have, but I, I need to see if you have it anyway. Can you get me a flathead screwdriver? <laughs> <laughs> and so she brought me a flathead screwdriver and I just had to tighten where the uh, plunger recesses in the door, and then it closes fine, but it was a really old door handle, and it's not like one that you can go to Home Depot and get today, you have to completely remodel that door. And the door itself, if I remember right, has a glass area up top. You have panels, and you just don't see things like that anymore. If you sit in their front room, the, the front room of their house is beautiful, and that it has, I don't even know what kind of wood is up there, but it's really dark, uh, so it's, heavy beams set in the roof, in the ceiling, and it quadrants off the ceiling from the rest of the ceiling surface. And it's just really, I guess you might say, old craftsmanship. Just a lot of old touches, and then you go, and I can see from where I'm seated in the, in the uh, dining area, I can see into the kitchen, they have a beautiful laminate countertop. If I remember right, it's like a yellowish. Is that, is that about right? But anyway, she, she doesn't even remember. And so I'm looking at it and think, wow, that's, that's, it's original. It is original. Can I tell you something? More than likely, when you sell your house, it's probably going to sell within the first couple of days that it's listed. Um, it's carried by Carrie um, Smalley. And it's probably going to sell within that first week. And there's a really solid chance that whoever moves into that house is going to make a lot of changes. And should you ever come back to Filer and visit your neighborhood, it's going to look dramatically different than what you remember it as. The tree, I don't know what's going to happen with the tree. The driveway, they might put in more gravel. The windows, they may change out the windows. You know, everyone does that with houses today, don't they? So there's changes, there's all these changes that people make on the homes that they live in. And there's that certain part of you that, oh, I, I invested so much time. I've seen some of the homes where, I, where my wife and I have been. We've planted trees and, and done a lot of landscape and done a change on the house. 
and then you go back and look at the house, and they've ripped out the trees, they've ripped out the landscaping, they've changed the landscaping the way that they want, and then you look at what they've done the rest of the house, and wow, how could they ever do that? That's so terrible. But yet, someone else like that, likes it, don't they? And so, you watch those changes take place, and so, I cannot help but think when you come to this passage of Scripture, that's one of the thoughts that I have, that the Bible says in the book of Genesis, when God creates heaven and earth, remember what God says about heaven and earth as he creates it, and God saw it, and it was good. Think on that for a moment. God saw it, and it was good. God sees it now, what would God say? Is it good? I'll let that sit there for a moment. So, God knows before things go in an unexpected direction. When we talk about God knows, God knows before life goes bad. God knew Ted and Shirley Vance would be moving up to Washington before Ted and Shirley even began discussing it. Can I ask you a personal question? That is, does God know the details of your life? Yes. So God knows the details of your life before it even goes in the unexpected direction. Um, God established a relationship with Abraham in the book of Genesis chapter number 12. And three chapters later, God talks with Abraham and says to Abraham, Abraham, I want to tell you something. Your offspring are going to become captives in a land where they are strangers, in the land of Egypt. They're going to be captive there for over 400 years. God knew what would happen before it even happened. God knows before the unexpected happens in your life, and my life. Doesn't he know that? God knows when you and I are going through turmoil and on the outside it looks good, but God knows when it's really not going good. The book of Matthew chapter 5, and I referenced this this morning in our Sunday school class, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, chapter number 6, chapter number 7, if you look in your Bible, it's all red letters, if you have a red letter edition, because that indicates that Jesus is talking. And Jesus is talking on the Mount of Beatitudes. And he's talking to the crowds of people that are there. And one of the things that he references there specifically was, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Within the same exact verses, he's also said that you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, it's no good but to be trampled under the feet of men. Little do the people who are hearing this understand that within the next 30 to 40 years, the nation of Israel is going to be turned upside down and will be conquered by Titus in 70 AD. Little did they know, but yet God knew that, didn't they? God knows when everything looks good on the outside, really, there's problems that no one else can see quite yet. God knows those things. God knows how it's all going to work out. God knows the good, God knows the bad, God knows the ugly, and God knows how he's going to bring about a resolution to the whole thing. God knows all those details. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse number 6, we find the exact quote that we would find in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse number 32. Let me give you a context of this, and that is Jesus Christ, or Jesus, the son of Mary, the stepson, if I may say, of Joseph, have now brought Jesus to the temple. And when they go to the temple, there is a man, a prophet who's there, who's been told he's going to live until he sees Jesus Christ. And his name is Simeon. And he sees Jesus, Mary, and Joseph come into the temple, and he comes up to them and he begins to gather around them and prophesy the promises of God. And what he literally says is, Jesus is a light to light who? The Gentiles. and the glory of thy people. You see, Simeon knew, most importantly, that Christ's purpose was not only to provide the answer for the Jewish people whom God promised to make a covenant with, but Simeon also understood that God's plan was far greater 
and what even the Jews understood. I think that carries tremendous weight. So God knows all the details that happen in your life and happen in my life before it has even begun. There are many things that you and I watch, observe, imagine as you get ready to pack up and move. You want to make sure that everything is taken care of properly, right? Don't dig the walls, don't hit my furniture, don't drop the box, it's very precious, very important. God knows all these things that are important to you and I. And so with that in mind, as we read the book of Matthew chapter 6, remember Christ still is talking to the crowds that are gathered there on the hillside. One of the things that said, Christ says, take no thought for what's going to be on the morrow, for tomorrow will take care of the things thereof. If I can take care of the birds of the air, if I can take care of the flowers of the field, as Christ is saying, can I not take care of who? You. Me. God knows exactly what it is that I need on so many different levels. And that's the irony as we think about God's word. We think about all the different situations that are represented in the room today. God knows those details, and God is working in a very personal way in each of our lives to meet our specific needs. Now, it may not go in the direction that we think that it should go, but God is working nonetheless. So that brings us to the book of Revelation, chapter number 19, verses 1, 1 through 21. And we're closing up the book of Revelation as we've gone through here. And so we pick it up with chapter 19, verse number 1. Here's what it said. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our Lord. And I wrote this down, praise the Lord, Psalm chapter 150, verse number 6, because uh, it started making my mind run through different things. Have you heard of uh, Handel's Messiah? In Handel's Messiah, they have the Hallelujah Chorus. If you think about the Hallelujah Chorus, technically speaking, in the King James Version of the language of the Bible that we reference, as well as in Strong's Encyclopedia, you don't find hallelujah or hallelujah at all in the Old Testament. It's not there. You find it in the New Testament, and you actually find it in very few places in Scripture. You find this hallelujah, this is actually in the New International Version, but literally it means this, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise to Yahweh. And the irony of ironies is you don't find hallelujah, hallelujah, in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, until you get to the close of the book of Revelation, when things are at their darkest, and everyone in heaven begins shouting hallelujah to the Lord. It's easier for you and I to see the close of the book than it is when we're right in the middle of the book because we really just don't know where it's going to go, do we? We oftentimes look at our lives and wonder, where is my life going? I don't like this chapter of life. And yet God says, just hang on. I'm still writing. I'm still working out the details here. Praise the Lord. Verse number two, for true and just are his judgments. And that's the focal point. We can praise God because why? Because he is true. Because he's just. Consistently. That's who God is. It goes on. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of the serpents. You remember in chapter 18 we were referencing specifically how the religious vehicle that time has known throughout a long period has finally reached its end. And throughout the book of Revelation, how many times have we seen the church and believers who have been martyred for their faith crying out, God, what are you going to bring? Justice. When are you going to bring vengeance? And so we have all those things coming to fulfillment in the chapter number 18. Now you're seeing it reflected here in chapter 19, verse number 1 and 2. Because God has even the score, if I may say it like that. He has avenged her blood, her, the blood of his servants. Verse number 3. And again, they shout out once again. There's that word, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Verse number 4. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. That's the focal point. 
And thanks be to God. Do we thank God for what it is that we experience in our life, whether it be good or bad? Not always, because it's really hard when you're going through the hard times. It's a little bit easier when you're going through good times, but nonetheless, you get the idea as you go through Revelation chapter number 19. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all of you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. We can look back on the other side, understanding the timeline of how God's work and give him praise then, can we not? But can we not do that in the here and the now? Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse number 7 of Revelation chapter number 19. We can take that. We can also reference Matthew chapter 22, verse number 1 through 14, which deals with what? You may remember this. The wedding, supper, when there's not enough to be there, and what does the Lord say? Send out to the highways and byways and call those who would come. Verse number 8, fine linen and bright and clean was given to her where fine linen stands for the righteousness acts of God's holy people. Passage found in the book of Romans, 2 Corinthians, as well as Colossians, all deal with how God views those who know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that there has been a dynamic change, that God views us through the prism of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sins and uniquely presents us as a different type of individual before God the Father, rather than being clothed in our sins. Are you familiar with the story of Pilgrim's Progress? Do you remember what Pilgrim had on his back? His burden. His burden represented his sins. But when he came to the cross, the burden fell away, and then he was given new clothes to represent his new perception, his new image in Jesus Christ. Verse number nine. Then the angel said to me, and here we go through the transition in this particular chapter. Now we're, we have folks in the first seven verses of God's goodness. Now in the concluding verses that we see here from chapter, from verse number nine to verse number 21, we see more darkness that's right. Uh, written for us. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding, the supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Don't do that. I'm your fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. I think this is an interesting thought that you and I find here. We find one, John. If you remember, here in chapter 19, chapter 18, John is dealing with angels. And he is getting a glimpse into what is going to be happening. And so as John hears all this information, he's overcome with emotion, overcome with a wonder and amazement at what God is doing. And he bows. And the angel says, no, don't do this because I'm bearing the testimony of who? Jesus. Okay? Now I want you to remember that. And I want you to know that because we're going to touch on this for just a moment. I'm, I hold the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for it is the spirit of the prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse number 10, do you remember how it talks about Satan? It talks about Satan as being the, uh, what? The accuser of who? The brethren, of which you and I are, as we know Jesus Christ. So when we go back and we look at what we've just referenced here in verse number 10, we have an angel bearing the testimony of Jesus in the courtroom of heaven where the devil is the prosecuting attorney, if I may say it like that, and the angel is bearing the defensive case of what Jesus has done and how you and I have benefited from that. You follow that logic? It's related there in the word of God as well. But we also know as we've looked at Scripture that there is going to be a point in time where Satan is cast out of heaven, isn't it? Pieces and parts of Scripture. Verse number 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True, with justice he judges and wages war. Jude, verse number 14 and 15, bear evidence of this exact passage of Scripture that we see here. Verse number 12, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. In Revelation chapter number five, who is the focal point of Revelation chapter number five? Jesus Christ. It relates to him in his power, 
It relates to him in his glory. It also relates to him in his relationship with God the Father. Verse number 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Don't necessarily expect that, do we? And his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Once again, here in verse number 14, we're dealing with this period that's uh, anticipating and moving towards Armageddon. In 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse number 17, as you may recall, it was Elijah. Excuse me, it was Elisha, excuse me. He was there in a town where the armies of Israel were gathered to capture him. And Elisha woke up. He wasn't afraid of the armies because he knew that there was a greater force that was defending him, which is the armies of the Lord. His servant didn't see it, but what did Elisha do? He says, Lord, I pray you that he would be able to see as I can see right now. Do we live in a difficult day and age today? Yes. Can we see what's going on around us? No. But God knows, doesn't he? Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword. And once again, who's this speaking of? Verse number 15, speaking of Jesus Christ. A sharp sword which was to strike down the nation. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the wine versus the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, describes to us the primary tool of the sword of the word of God, which does what? Because the son of the bone, spirit, marrow, the thoughts, and the intents of the heart. That's how God's word defies and surgically acts upon you and I. But there's coming a greater point in time when the word of God is going to have a more destructive power, which it does. Verse number 16, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. David specifically references this in Psalm chapter 45, verse number 3. We have a tendency of looking through the word of God without understanding how much comparison there is from Scripture to Scripture. I think it becomes important and pivotal for you and I to understand that Scripture is not written accidentally, but Scripture is written with intent in mind. Verse number 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. Now, it's not exactly the great potluck of God that he had in mind that everyone's eating something really good and nutritious, but what's happening Armageddon is happening, death and destruction is occurring. Isaiah chapter 33, verse number 1 through 6 contain that same exact time frame that God knew before and God knew now. Verse number 18, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses, of the mighty of horses and the riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse number 33, 33 also covers that same exact context. So the word of God gives us proof after proof, after proof, after proof about discussions or considerations that we oftentimes do not give ourselves time to reference and to read. And then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse of his army. So finally we see here Antichrist galvanizing himself and deciding that I am now going to oppose God, which he's been doing from the very beginning, and now you see that being referenced here in verse number 19. Verse number 21, 20. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet would perform the signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Psalm chapter 2, once again, gives you and I another perspective of how God views this time and the warnings and the indication that we are also giving from a biblical perspective. So there's a lot of meat, there's a lot of details that the Word of God relates there. But the focal point that I want to share with you is God has known all this from the beginning of time, hasn't He? It's not a surprise. Would it surprise you to know that God has also given us key indicators, not just the book of Revelation, but you could actually go all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy that was written by who? Moses. Of some of the very things that we see in the book of Revelation that God has known from the beginning of time, and it's not a shock to him. The point I want you to understand and grasp I know it's coming out from a different angle. And I, and I guess this is what speaks to me. Nothing that happens is a surprise to God. 
God has known it all along. God gives you and I warnings. He gives you and I indicators. And it's not a shock. So why is it oftentimes we get shocked by what it is that we see and experience? Follow with me here. Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is before Moses dies in the book of Deuteronomy. I remember right, Deuteronomy has 34, maybe 35 chapters. And God has specifically talked to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter number 31. Then God says to Moses at the close of chapter 31, Moses, here's a song that I want you to sing to Israel. I want you to teach them the words so that they know what their history is going to look like. Not just their past, but their present and their future. We oftentimes want to know what our future looks like, don't we? I remember when I was in junior high, I was so excited about getting my driver's license. I remember when I had my driver's license, I was so excited about graduating from high school. When I was graduating from high school, I was so excited about graduating from college. When I was so excited from graduating from college, I was looking forward to getting married. When I was done getting married, I was so excited looking forward to have kids. After I had kids, I was so excited to look forward to owning my own house. You get the idea that you have all these stages you're going through. Imagine if you could, from the beginning of time, see where the course of life would take you. And no doubt it would be those points of time when you shake your head and say, wow, I can't believe I would make that mistake. Oftentimes you see on the internet, whether it be Facebook or wherever it is you go, people who write letters to themselves, and a letter to my younger self. Have you ever seen something like that? And I oftentimes thought, what would I do if I could write a letter to my younger self? What if God has already written me a letter to my younger self and I just haven't read it? Deuteronomy chapter 32, I want you to see what God says. And we're 20 verses in here, and I obviously am not going to read you the whole thing. But I want, you, I want to encourage you to read Deuteronomy chapter 32. God says this, I will hide my face from them and see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation. Children who are unfaithful. God already knew the twist and turn that the nation of Israel would go through today. God knew that. He said, they made me jealous by what is no God and angered me with their worthless idols. Now catch this here in the last half of verse number 21. When God says, I will make them envious by those who are not a people. We have Israel who is a people. The church is not a people in the way of a nation, a kindred, or a tribe, but a church is a call it assembly made up of many tribes, many nations, many tongues. God has already foreordained all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 32 that I know the issues that we are going to face. I know where we're at now. I know the problems I'm going to run into later, but I know, it's going to, how I, I know how it's going to turn out. And God says, I'm going to make them envious by those who are not a people. I am going to fulfill my covenant to them, but I am also going to provide my son as a sacrifice for sin, and by my son's blood, even as Simon said in the book of Luke chapter 2, verse number 32, what would he be? A light to who? The Gentiles. I will make them envious by those who are not a people. I will make them angry by a nation that has no understanding. Book of Romans, chapter 10, verse number 19 to 21. Catch what Paul says. He says, again I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses said, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Hundreds, if not thousands of years later, the Apostle Paul comes to some conclusions that Moses had no clue concerning. What does that enable the Apostle Paul to understand this? 
Was it because he was really smart? What was at work in his life? Can someone help me with that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enabled him to understand that there is a, if I may say like these, this is, these are my words, a transition the way that God is doing things because God was working through his people, a nation of Israel, and God brought his son. They declined him. They refused him. They crucified him. But now God opens up the gospel to who? The Gentiles. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hand to a disobedient and an obstinate people. And it goes on in the book of Romans chapter number 11 where God then proclaims to the apostle Paul that just like a vine tree that will be grafted back into the vine, God has a plan. Does God have a plan for your life? Does God have a purpose for your life? I dare say moving from Fire, Idaho to Kenwick, Washington wasn't exactly the plan. At this point, may have been a plan later. But God has a plan for our lives. I think oftentimes we lose sight of the fact that this is not a surprise to God. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 35, it goes on to say this, it is mine to avenge. We oftentimes want to take things into our hands, but God says, no, no, I'll take care of the business. I will avenge it. I will repay in due time their foot will slip. The day of their disaster is near and their doom rushes upon them. God's the one who's responsible for vengeance. That's why the book of Romans chapter 12, verse number 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will pray. It is vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know, oftentimes we do not take the verses that we're familiar with and put them into the specific context that God has in mind. Why does Paul say this? Why did God say this? Because God knows that there's coming some really dark times for the nation of Israel. There's coming some really dark times for the church. And who's going to set the score straight? God does that. It's a hard thing to take my foot off the pedal when it's God who's behind the wheel. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, once again, verse number 39 through 43, here's what it says. See now that I myself am he. There is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal, and no one can deliver out of my hand. <clears throat> I lift my hand to heaven and solemnly swear, as surely as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword <clears throat> and my hand grasps in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. God had done it before with his people, had he not? Is God capable of doing it again in the future? Most definitely can. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain, the captives, the heads of the enemy leaders. Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land. When you and I take some time to read Revelation chapter 19, verse number 1 through 6, we see the saints in heaven, those who have been martyred, those who have, been those who have passed. We see all the generations that are there. They are seeing glory to God, aren't they? Why? Because they've seen God's consistency. They've seen the process that God fulfills his word time after time after time. The book of Lamentations says this, I'm going to close the with this, when it says this, Jeremiah said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. <coughs> when you take time and read Revelation, there's a lot of darkness, there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of events that we try to make sense of, but in fairness, I'm not going to be able to give it proper justice. You can probably find a lot of other people who can do a much better job than I can ever do. But one thing I do know is God is good. One thing I do know is God knows how it started. God knows where it's at. God knows how much worse it's going to be. But through it all, God's good. It does not matter where you and I move to. God's goodness is the same as it is in Father as it would be in Kenwood, Washington, or anywhere else that you choose to go. God is good. 
That's why Jeremiah said, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Why? Because he shows me grace. God knows the struggle I'm going to go through as I load up the van on Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever it is. And I'm going to ask for God's love. And he's going to give that to me. He's going to show me his care. He's going to show me compassion. He's going to guide me as we take our truck from Fiverr, Idaho, all the way up to Washington. He's going to make sure that we don't run out of gas, that we won't go astray. He's going to take care of us. Why? Because his compassion never fails. I cannot help but believe God is good. Regardless of the times that we live through, God is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your promises. We thank you that you have known our course before we were even born. You have known the world that we would be born into. You know the struggles and trials that we've lived through. And you would guide us every single step of the way. As much as we would like to take vengeance and make things right on our, on our own, we can see, we can understand the principles of Scripture that give us the encouragement, give us the warning that vengeance is yours and you will repay. It may not satisfy our timeline, but God, it is your timeline that is perfect. I pray that in all things that we will ever see that you are a good and gracious God. Lord, help us to live with that understanding and not stray.